<laughs> Let's get ready to rumble! <laughs> you want to have a, a group huddle before we start again? Come on, buddy, we can do this. <laughs> One, two, three, literary roadhouse! <laughs> Quite weird. Oh, God, we're touching this. <laughs> Okay, let's calm down so I can do the intro. Because this is all live. Nice. I think I'm getting an... Yeah, I'm getting an echo from somewhere. One, two, three. This is Literary Roadhouse. One short story, once a week. I'm Maya. I'm Gerald. I'm Remy. And I'm Anais. Before we get started, keep in mind that we're a bunch of dirty talking good for nothings. So for those of you watching live, we'll do our best to keep this clean for the children, but please don't confuse that with a promise. And for those of you downloading this, check the show notes. That's where we let you know whether or not we fudged up. <laughs> oh, so true. So much truth. So this week, we have a major treat for you. We, on our website, we have a link that you can leave us a voicemail message or feedback. And this week, we have our very first feedback from an author, no less. The author, Angela Mitchell, who wrote um, Anywhere But Here, uh, sent us a voicemail message. Annie, uh -oh. play that beautiful footage. <laughs> Hi, all. This is Angela Mitchell, uh, author of Not From Here. And I just have to tell you, it was a really fun and interesting to listen to you discuss this this story. Um, I did cringe a couple of times and wince a few times, but overall, I'm going to take it as a compliment that uh, that a story of mine could um, elicit such passionate feelings of either like or dislike. Um, and really, this is terrific what you all do, and I really want to thank you for that. In answer to your question, is this typical of the work that I do? I can honestly say that it is not. First person, in particular, is an area that I don't much like to creep into, but I decided to try to get out of my, my comfort zone. In any case, thank you again, and um, and keep up the great work. That was so awesome. Not only did she send us that, but she was amazingly wonderful by voicemail. I was just so excited to receive her message, especially since I really liked her story. I was like, I had a little fangirl moment. <laughs> <laughs> I'm desperately trying to remember what I said about it now. <laughs> yeah, you probably don't want to remember. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> I was squirming in my chair as I heard it. I was so excited. I was just like happy. I started like prancing around the house. <laughs> I was just so happy. Really? Yay, somebody's <laughs> writing me. <laughs> <laughs> so if you would like to leave us your own voicemail feedback, go to the website, literaryroadhouse.com, and there is a link that says, what does it say? Does it say talk to me? Does it say leave a voicemail? Leave, it says something like that. It's on the side of the screen. Just click it, and you can send us your wonderful voicemail, and maybe we will play it on air. So I guess I should go right into the summary of this story, shouldn't I? Because this story is all my fault. Um, yes, this week. Is. <laughs> was that a clue to your feelings, Rami? You like recognize both your feelings. <laughs> so, Rami, tell me how you really feel. Well, actually, save that till after yeah. the summary. Um, <laughs> this week we read *The Largess of the Sea Maiden* by Dennis Johnson, and this story was actually told as a series of vignettes, I would say. The first vignette opens up with a bunch of people having drinks and talking, and just talking about like the most loud experience they ever had and the most quiet experience they ever had. And the highlight of that portion, portion of the story is one of the gentlemen is missing a leg. None of them really realized it. And he tries to get one of the women to kiss it in order to see it. And it, everything gets really uncomfortable and awkward. And later on, I guess they get married. Um, the second portion is a bunch of people, uh, two couples having drinks and talking and they drink a little too much and the guy burns, torches his painting. The next one, um, the narrator is, I, I guess a few years later, he works in advertising and he comes in and he's in pain and I guess he's getting some kind of award. The next one, he finds out his ex-wife is dying, and you hear a lot about regret and all the sins that he's committed through his life. And then um, he talks about a, a guy that's on death row and his friend who interviewed the gentleman on death row and then interviewed 
the wife of the gentleman on death row and about their lying and secrets and how the lying allowed the gentleman that died to die happy and, and feeling proud. And then we go into meeting a painter who's slightly insane, who ends up killing himself, and they all sit around, have a memorial. Everyone at the memorial realizes none of them knew each other, knew him very well, and then it goes to the advertising award, and somebody tries to pick up the narrator in the bathroom, like literally pick up the narrator in the bathroom, and pretty much um, the story ends with the guy taking a walk and, you know, reminiscing, I guess, on all the crap that's going on. Like, it's, it, to summarize, the story is difficult, okay, because the story has a lot going on, which I'm assuming is going to be the major focus of our conversation, because there's a lot going on in the story. So, let's start with Rami, because he just took a really big breathing sigh, and that just makes me excited for the podcast. So, Rami, I'm going to wind you up and let you loose. How did you feel about this story on a basic level? All right. I mean, before I begin, let me just say that that the that never voice ends message, well. <laughs> no, no, the voice message by Angela Mitchell. I think that makes me much more timid about giving my honest feedback about the story because there's a chance that the author might actually see this. So, oh, we had several saying, authors email us. You didn't know that, Remy? Yeah, I don't want to hurt anyone's involved. feelings. He's like though. a living legend. Okay, now hey, okay. hey, <laughs> look, hey, I'll Remy, start we've out. already hurt someone's feelings. We've got, we've rode that thing. It's okay. We survived. Right. I'll begin <laughs> any of my thoughts. I'll qualify it by saying, Dennis Johnson, I know you're a noted, uh, respected American writer. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> he won, this is going to take some listen, time. <laughs> he won the National Book Award for Fiction, okay? So I think that's a big deal, and that means something. This might have just been like a lapse of judgment, or something. Like it's no reflection upon your character. <laughs> Can someone auto-tune that into a song that we'll just play for every episode? I totally! Please! Please! <laughs> anyway, Remy. So, Remy, tell us how you felt about the story. And please be honest. All right, all right. So, yeah, I just needed to, to qualify Just rip the Band-Aid off, hon. Rip the Band-Aid so, off. It's okay. You'll I mean, get okay. used to this. You, you mentioned already in your summary that it's a series of vi vignettes. And honestly, I don't mind that. If they at least had like some in remote way had something to do with each other, but I didn't see them connected whatsoever. Um, I don't know. I I don't understand where the title fits in with anything in the story. I mean, at the very last line, there's a mention of a sea maiden, but that's not like I, I don't know. Maybe this is kind of nitpicking with the title, but I mean, there's there's a bunch of stuff. I don't know if we can get into more. Oh, we'll get into it. I, I, I found stuff. It, go ahead. I, I found stuff which was grammatically incorrect. Um, I found like, <laughs> I, like I I think some of the descriptions of people. Like at one point, he says like a group of mental mentally handicapped people are like zombies. I don't think that's appropriate. Um, and then he says there was a boy with sideways eyes. Like, does that mean that he was Asian? Another thing that's like, okay, what are you doing right now? Um, and generally, I think he like the story tries too hard to portray the characters like um, like as, as as jaded or it's like an exaggerated portrayal. Um, like all the personalities are a bit exaggerated. So you have like an egotistical, self-absorbed artist. You have the proud, arrogant, belligerent, like rich boss. You have, you know, the guy who's, like, just fed up with life. You know, the narrator, it reminded me of, um, it reminded me, you know, the cartoon Droopy with the big saggy cheeks, like, I hate my life. I felt like that was him just talking. <laughs> I was just barely keeping it together, Rami. <laughs> I was working so hard to keep it together. Oh, crap, now I'm sweating. <laughs> I think that's the first time Droopy's made an appearance on the podcast. <laughs> really, like, or awesome. if, if you've ever seen Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Oh, yeah. Oh, Marvel. Lord. Marvel. Just, Marvel. Yeah. Okay, we're, we're going to cut him off. Where, where's the hook? <laughs> I, I want the hook. I want an hour monologue from Rami right now. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I have the 
I have sunscreen on. All my sunscreen is in my eyeballs right now. <laughs> and it's all Remy's fault. I'm sorry. No, this is brilliant. This is so podcast. brilliant. We do need to put this portion to music. <laughs> and, and then put the recording right underneath his profile. <laughs> okay. Um, Gerald. Hello. <laughs> Remember me? Rescue me. <laughs> um, I, I liked the story. <laughs> Oh no! Oh no! Yes. I, I like you see, because because he might be listening, so I thought it was wonderful. <laughs> like, all of the other authors, they're so wonderful. No. <laughs> <laughs> Bit of decorum, please. <laughs> we are professional. We have so. no decorum. We're the literary roadhouse. There oh, is no sorry. decorum here. <laughs> Wrong podcast. Yeah, <laughs> it's. Um, I, I, I loved the vignettes. I, I, I saw the, the connection between them, which, which was him. And I think that one of the key things when, towards the end when he said, I'm, uh, I got more... Uh, uh, wait a minute. Uh, um, there's another phrase. It's a, I note that I've lived longer in the past now than I can expect to live in the future. And that really sums the, the story up for me. It's just his reminiscences. He's just, he's just an old, sort of ordinary he's an old guy. Dude. Yeah. <laughs> even even older than me, so that's pretty old. <laughs> anyway, that's, that's top level. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Ha- so I've noticed a trend in these past few podcasts. Gerald and I tend to be in the same camp over here. How's this happening? Because I'm Team Gerald right now. Yeah. I liked it. I definitely see many common threads. The one that Gerald mentioned and a few others. I thought mm-hmm. it was great. I mean, I also have some criticisms and stuff that I will bring up. But hey, overall solid. Um, and I'll take your solid. I'll raise it a notch. This is one of my most favorite stories we've read on the podcast. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> Which is what makes it so funny. Because <laughs> I'm listening to Romy and I am dying inside. Um, so what did I love about it? First. What One of the things I loved about it was, um, well, first, I will say, the first vignette, I wasn't sure where it was going. It took me several vignettes to really, it was like seducing me. It was gradually pulling me in and all these pieces were separate and they were gradually coming together into this very coherent um, musing musing over mortality, end of life, middle age and, and looking back at your life and how your life stops becoming a narration and really becomes a series of memories become like a series of paintings or a series of vignettes. You don't look back on your life and have one narration. You look back and you have this memory and this memory and then this memory and then this memory. And there was something about it that I thought was extremely beautiful. Um, I'll admit I only read it one time. I don't think I could read it a second time because it was a very emotional read for me. And it completely, completely pulled me in. I, I love this story. This is going to be a fun conversation. Yeah, <laughs> I, don't mind, I don't mind being the odd man out here. Oh, that's why we like you. I, <laughs> I fully expect you to get used to this position. Huh? <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I think it's funny that you said, uh, that, that Maya, you said, you know, I really love this story. And it's it's sort of not really a story, is it? It's, it's just a little... Uh, a, a few scenes. It's just a collection of scenes from from this guy's life, but it it really sh- I think it really shows you what what this guy's like. You know how how he's lived his life. He's been pretty you know reasonably successful, um, but there's all these little sort of slightly strange, slightly comedic, slightly off the wall things that that have happened. Very much. Something that sort of struck me about the main character is so. I forget the exact wording Rami used, but he is very aloof, and that aloofness translates into he's somebody who's looking but isn't really seeing, right? Um, mm-hmm. Like he looks at these paintings in his house, but it it never translates into 
knowing who Tony is. He sees his wife as a good cook who's companionable, but doesn't he, he can't even explain who she is. He's like, oh, I guess she's into our daughters. His daughters are ni neither clever nor beautiful because he doesn't take the time to really look at anything. So it's really interesting when throughout the story, there's all these little moments where it seems like he's going to actually have an opportunity to see something, to unravel a mystery of life, to ponder something, or maybe to discover that he squandered his life. And he stops mm -hmm. just shy of that realization every time, which I thought was beautifully and subtly done. Yeah, I, I think um, one of the things that struck me, well, we'll probably get into symbolism later. Um, but one of the things that really struck me was how much of his life was lived as a facade. And he even says, you know, when everyone else is in costume, his costume is getting worn, old, tired. He's tired of it. And I, I really felt like that was why he didn't really see his wife. He didn't, he cheated on all of his ex-wives. His daughters weren't that interesting. He's been living this life of going through the motions and doing what looks appropriate, doing what looks successful um, without really exploring it. And the only time that I got a sense that he really like was in touch with himself was when he was talking about art. Um, I think that was a really core thread throughout the piece. It structured the piece. It made the vignettes make sense to me, but also those moments seemed very true. And when his friend Tony, after the memorial, Anne gives him the book of recipes and says that Tony said he was his best friend, and he says, I don't see how, you know, I hardly knew him, but from the outsider looking in, he was the best friend because he related to Tony through his art. And as an artist, that's who you really are. And Tony, that's the only time he's really who he is. So it didn't matter if he knew everything else. I mean, that's where the truth was. And I, I thought that was so beautifully rendered. I also thought what was beautifully rendered was, I, I think this was a really, really good example of older male mindset in literature, in modern literature. I've been reading so much modern stuff that's all about youngsters or it's about like super old people, but this was like a really nice cross section of a time of life for this man who was once, who was really successful and he's still working, but he's older and he's starting to reflect and people around him are starting to die. And I thought it was beautifully rendered. Yeah, I, th I, th I think there was some some lovely, um, lovely phrases, lovely pieces of writing, all throughout that that just I, I thought were delightful. Some some very clever um, imagery that was going on, and um, I, it's just it, I don't know. Outwardly, the, this guy is, seems quite sort of down, quite 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 droopy, <laughs> quite marvelous. But, but he he's he he's he's had some interesting experiences. He's got he's got some interesting things to look back on, and so he, as as a as a sort of a straightforward story, it, it was it was interesting. I, I you know each time I read it through, it was it, it took virtually no time at all. It was it was a very good read. I have a question. Um, we talked about this once when Roz Morris was on, and. Um, but we haven't revisited it, and I feel like we've talked about so many stories now, it might be a good time to revisit, especially since Rami is new to the podcast, and we're starting to branch out into more experimental types of stories. How We've heard multiple times somebody had says, this doesn't feel like a story. What is a story to you? And has that changed? since we started the podcast. For Rami, what is the story what is a story? But for the other two of you, has your definition of story changed over the course of the last what thirty six episodes, thirty seven, something like that? Uh, I guess when in response to what is a story, I think my definition is pretty straightforward. It's a way of you know organizing experiences um, and presenting it that can either convey a message or provide some sort of information um, that's transmitted, you know, from person to person or from one generation to the next. Yeah, I, I think I think my I mean my my definition of a story 
would be something that has a beginning, a middle, and an end, and, a, and an identifiable beginning, middle, and an end, um, and and some sort of some sort of resolution or conclusion, or or you know when you get to the end that it's the end, it's it, the story is complete. So in in that context, this this didn't meet that that criteria. It, it wasn't. It wasn't a story, but as a collection of small stories, um, I, I think it worked really well. And and by the same token, the in a way the final piece, uh, the final few paragraphs were were the end of the story because he's 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 finished telling his little vignettes, and then he's looking back at the whole lot, and. Um, and 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 you know then then sort of coming to the conclusion what what is his life it's uh, and it's it's he comes to, I think he comes to the conclusion his life isn't really that much it's not you know he's he's had all these things happen but but he's always looking for something else yeah I I tend to be I think I might be one of the loose here probably more like Maya where like my definition of a story is probably a little bit wider. I would say this is a story, or at the very least, I mean, you have 10 <coughs> individual stories that very clearly do have a beginning, middle, and end, as Gerald was saying. Each one individually is like an excellent example of like flash fiction. They're self-contained. And then what you have to do is kind of find a thread between them. As I was reading it, I was thinking, you know, there's short story anthologies that have that. They'll have like full short stories that then in between you have to find like a common theme or what the author is exploring. I'm like, this guy did that like in miniature. He took an entire anthology and condensed it into one short story that you can read in one sitting, which I thought was really impressive. It, it's funny because I think when I started this podcast, I was very much in Gerald's camp as far as definition of a story. And <clears throat> The Roz Morris episode definitely um, challenged me to think more broadly. And as I read this story and the Twitter story, I'm realizing that my definition of the story has definitely broadened over the course of the podcast. Um, now I would say a story has to elicit some sort of change, either in the character or in me. I think that was one of the things that Roz said. Um, I, I feel like a story has to have a purpose of some sort. Um, so, you know, if you have a bunch of vignettes, but there's no purpose, either within the story or without. So I feel like even if the story doesn't necessarily have a purpose on paper, if it elicits a, a feeling of purpose to the reader, I feel like then it would definitely qualify as a story. It's interesting because I definitely felt like this was a story. And as, as you guys were talking, I'm realizing, you know, Traditionally, it very well isn't. It much more is like an anthology of stories, but the thread is so strong that it definitely feels like a story, and I think the reason why it feels like a story to me is because in reminiscing about his past, I feel like the character is evolving and changing, and I feel like it gave me as the reader a really strong experience. Um, I think it's interesting that Annie's liked the story so much because it I don't think I would have liked the story in my 20s. I don't think I would have really understood or even embraced it very well in my early 20s. Um, you know, I think probably until like I dated my first older boyfriend, I probably would have been very confused by it. Um, but having been up close and personal and watched somebody go through this kind of reminiscing and looking back on their life is like, oh, okay, so yeah, I totally get it. Um, but I don't think I would have gotten it earlier. And I, I think I, part of, oh, I was just going to respond to that directly, saying that I think um, part of why I it did resonate for me is actually because very recently my mother is saying a lot of these exact same things about having more memories behind her than things to look forward to. So then hearing that did help me see this. As I read it, I kept thinking of my mother. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I just, I was just sort of, I just looked back at the, um, at, at, at the file just now, and I'd forgotten that the final story is entitled Wit, uh, W H I T, which, which is him. So that's mm -hmm. the conclusion to, to the story. So he's, he's, he, he does his sort of self-analysis thing, and, um, but he, he sort of comes to the conclusion that he's, you know, his, his life isn't. As exciting as 
as the other people he's come into contact with. And so, so then he goes off and, and you know, look, goes in, in the neighborhood looking for a magic thread, a magic sword, a magic horse. So he's, he's looking for, for Which something. I loved. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think um, listening to you all give your feedback, I think part of my issue with the story is that it requires, like, too much extrapolation. Like, all of you have presented... You, you sort of created a context that may or may not be what the author intended, but you placing the character in that sort of context makes sense. But I think for me, saying something as simple as, you know, he was sitting on at his desk, you know, reminiscing about the past, or even like lying on his deathbed or something like that. And then at the end, if he just said like, oh, and it all made him, you know, one, it left him wondering about the meaning of life or something like that. But way it was presented first of all like from the beginning I wasn't sure okay are these memories or uh, is he describing you know things that have unfolded how long ago was this and all and it and it just there's no transition from one story to the next with the exception of maybe one um, vignette and, and and then it just ends he's looking for some magical shoe or something I don't know <laughs> yeah I, I think I, I actually agree with you. Um, you know, the story definitely was left you off center. Like, it would drop you here, and then it would drop you there. And I think how much you enjoy the story is directly, like, going to correlate to how comfortable you are being in being dropped in so many gray areas. Um, and I think that is legitimate. I, I don't think everyone is going to like the story. I think the story forces the reader to stretch. I think it forces you to be more of a Barthes reader rather than a Nabokovian reader. And um, oh, <laughs> the idea of reading the story and and having the story be controlled by the author versus reading the story and having the story be controlled by the reader. So a Nabokovian reader would read the story and would not want to put in too much of their interpretation. They might research the writer, might research what the writer was trying to say, whereas a Barthes reader is going to read the story and be more interested in what the reader's experience is. And I think that in this case, this author Actually, I would I would venture to say if I interviewed this author, I would not be surprised if the author said, "I wrote this, and I was more in, and I'm more interested in what readers have to say about the story than and and he might be one of those writers like I'm not going to tell you what I, what I meant. I'm not going to explain it. Um, I just get that sense in the way that he dropped me in different places that 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 he was directing me to force me to come up to my own conclusions and that's going to be very uncomfortable for a lot of readers. And you're right because I did read an interview he did with the New Yorker discussing this story. It's super short. He doesn't give anything. The closest thing he gives oh, I nailed it, didn't I? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> nailed it. The closest thing he gives you to the meaning is he says that the story reminds him of Billy Strayhorn's uh, composition Lush Life. That's the closest you get. And oh, he's I like him. It as if he didn't write it. <laughs> He's not like it was inspired by this or I noticed. No, he's like, oh, the story reminds me as if it was someone else's story. So he's <laughs> definitely a very distant writer. Yeah, yeah, that's funny that I picked up on that right away. You know, he definitely, because I'm naturally more of a Nabokovian reader, and he, he seduced me into reading this in a much more introspective, analytical, what are my own emotions type way than I necessarily would off the bat. And I, I quite like the fact that, that he dropped you into different situations with no no sort of... Um, did they, what's that thing on the videos? Um, that, Teleprompters? You know, no, no. <laughs> the thing between scenes. Anyway, the, the, it's and there's no... Uh, there's no introduction to it. It's, it's bang. Here's a situation, and it's kind of funny, and it's kind of tragic, and and then bang. Here's another scene, and and I I enjoyed that. I I I was quite uh, quite happy going along with that. And yeah, I I, 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 I saw the I, I did the research as well. I I saw that interview, and and you know they they say <laughs> you know they say he he took sort of seven or eight years to write this story. Wow. And, uh, 
Yeah, <laughs> it takes it takes a long time to write. And that's a very different type of author interview than the previous author who's like, oh yeah, everybody misses the black guy. <laughs> he like wants to explain it, you know. Mm. <laughs> You know, but I, I know exactly what Rami's talking about because after I read it, so normally as I'm reading a story where the author's telling you things a bit more directly, as I'm reading it, I'm already thinking of things for the podcast. I'm like, oh, I should mention this or this is a thought that I had about this. As I read this, I was like, it was like blank space in my brain. And I finish <laughs> the story and I go, now what? <laughs> now I sit here and I'm like, <laughs> What do I say? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I think... You know, personally, I think that this was masterfully done, but it was masterfully done in a very specific way. And if you are not the type of reader who's going to enjoy that particular type of story, then you're not going to like it. It would be like if we read fairy a fairy tale and one of us hates fairy tales. It wouldn't matter how good the fairy tale is, you're still going to hate the dang story because it's a fairy tale. And I feel like this is a very specific type of writing. It, it's, it feels very experimental, even though I wouldn't, would you guys consider this experimental fiction? No, not really. I think uh, it's been, it's been done. Like this kind of aloof, distant look back on your life, white male protagonist, upper middle class with urban malaise. Like that's my one criticism. <laughs> like, okay, <laughs> you know, it's a little bit like uh, all right, but but it's so well done that it's you know it isn't it isn't on Dennis Johnson to provide for me the alternative story of like. It, you know what I mean? It, does it rest on his shoulders specifically and I'm going to like crucify him for this? No, I just kind of wish it existed, a more diverse offering. See, to me it felt very fresh and I think that was because of how it was told as far as the vignettes and the tie-in with, um, with art. It, it felt very fresh to me. And yeah, white male protagonist suffering from middle-aged malaise. Yes, uh, that's been done, but I don't think it's necessarily been done frequently from this perspective. I, I, I think it felt like a very fresh perspective to me. And and he didn't he he didn't sort of explicitly say that. He he was just thinking of all these interesting things that's that's happened, and then in in the final one, he he just wishes that his life were more interesting and more magical and and um you know he says yeah i i've been you know reasonably successful but and there's this whole thing about the bank and if you don't remember the bank then i haven't done my job very well have i and and all this sort of stuff it's it's really cleverly written i thought Do you you know, I, I almost hesitate to say, like, he's depressed or having malaise. I felt more like he was in a very detached way looking back on his life. Um, did anyone else have this sense as you were reading the story waiting for him to die? Like, I kept expecting him to have a heart attack. I just kept expecting it. I was surprised that he didn't. No, I didn't expect him to die because that would be way too interesting for this guy. Like... <laughs> <laughs> As I'm reading, I, I love you, Eddie's. <laughs> no, yeah, but it, it would suddenly something happen. Like that's not that's not this guy's life because he's not only <laughs> is he looking back at his life with this distance, but he lives his life with a distance. He's on the phone with his ex-wife. He doesn't even know which one it is. <laughs> which I attention. loved, by the way. I yeah. love that scene so or when much. Carl Zane, his old colleague, Carl Zane's son, Marshall Zane, says, "Oh, my father passed away." He leaves and he says, "Tell your father I said hi," because he's just not <laughs> paying attention ever. <laughs> but I, oh I, I attributed all of these like weird actions to like him being in some sort of depressive state that you don't act normally. Um, and another thing to note, I kind of felt like, and this is me just guessing here again, but it might have been something like autobiographical because you know he's also a white middle-aged man. Maybe he at some point is reflecting on his life. He also coincidentally has two ex-wives just saying <laughs> <laughs> did you feel my eye roll did you feel my eye roll so hard every single fiction author gets it so is this autobiographical did this really happen no, you know, no no not like the actual events but like it was it was um, like spurred on by his own feelings well of course of course if you're a 20 year old writer you're probably not going to be able to write a middle aged white male perspective on end of life and mortality at least i wouldn't be able to <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> description i think you probably nailed it 
I feel like there's no way like you would know that in such great detail unless you've experienced it as well. Exactly. It, it's funny that you mention um, those instances of him not paying attention. I actually wondered if maybe he was, you know, early onset of something, little early mm. onset Alzheimer's <laughs> between his um, between his lack of emotional affect and then forgetting things as soon as he's told them. I was like, hmm. <laughs> I, I just I just get the feeling that he's always been like this. He's <laughs> he's he's quite introspective. He's quite self-absorbed. He's um, he doesn't really care about other people, and he doesn't really care about himself. He doesn't care about anything really. He just he just seems to meander he through. He is. Yeah, he just is. Is um, and, and I didn't. Which I didn't... explains the commercial perfectly, like the commercial, mm. the way it's described. You're like. What? <laughs> okay, so the commercial comes on and it's this rabbit being chased by a bear and the rabbit is crying and then the rabbit gives the bear a dollar and the bear sits down and doesn't eat him. Like, that, that's the commercial. And <laughs> that's such like an 80s artsy commercial. Yeah. You know what's funny? It's like the epitome <laughs> of an 80s artsy like, commercial. <laughs> As soon as I saw furry mammals, I thought it was going to be the toilet paper commercial. <laughs> <laughs> or like hams, that the, um, the beer with the polar bears from the 80s. Because yeah, like, <laughs> I've been trained by our own advertisement in real life. Bears must be charming, obviously. <laughs> That's really funny, Annie's. <laughs> Interesting, just just looking at the where, where he dis describes this commercial... Um, and, and he, he says, uh, the music stopped, there's no sound, nothing is said, and right there, the little narrative ends on a note of complete uncertainty. And then it's da 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 and, um, and then it says, because it referred really to nothing at all, and yet it was actually very moving. So I think that's, that it's was the encapsulate It's like an encapsulation of the entire story. Mm. And, and of and a person's was, life, really. And that, and that was the the highlight of his life, and and that's you know that that sort of summed up the whole story for me. Mhm. Mm it did for me too, Daryl. Yeah. I, real quick, going back to, to the, you know, when Maya asked, did you, did you get the sense he was going to die? And I said no, because he's so boring. Dying would be too interesting for him. Part of why I say that though is because the imagery, as I'm picturing this, he's he's gray, and everything around him is super colorful. You know, there's this colorful big red recipe book, Tony's entire life, even the people at the memorial service, the park, the art museum, the blue painting over the mantle, everything has color except for this guy. So do we want to talk about symbolism and imagery? I think we already have, haven't we, really? Yeah, we kind of already have. Mm. Well, I... I when you were mentioning the art, the motif of the art throughout the 10 vignettes, um, so you said that you felt like the art, oh, I forget the exact phrasing, something like it helped him escape or add a little bit of color. Because I didn't... I, didn't I, I, I see, like, he's an ad man. He sees everything in vignettes and pictures. Like, that's how he sees things. He lives his life in in like little vignettes and pictures and I felt like the only time that he was ever really present in the story was when he was looking at art. So see, okay, so it's interesting that you say that because I caught the art thing a little bit differently. I feel like this is another one of those things where life is something that he's looking at but not seeing because he knows the name of the painters, he goes to the museum, but you get the sense, Tony comes up next to him, starts talking about the Hopper painting, the Cape Cod one of the gas station, and Tony has all of these opinions, and you don't get any opinions from the narrator, and you never get a sense, like, does he even care when the old boss is burning the painting? So I, I got this sense that it was another thing of like... Oh, I think he cared. He cared very much. Really? I didn't get the sense he cared. I cared more. I was like, you're crazy, Burning mm -hmm. Man. Like, no, he actually, no. I think he cared because he tried to, to stop it, and then he they just kind of gave up and watched him, like, try to burn it. But I think that was the only time I saw him in the story, like, actively try to do something. Um, was I don't when think he was he like, you shouldn't. Uh, but he was like, that's an eccentric thing. It was, thing. It was really well done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I, I, it's odd. Yeah. I mean, I'm not. I'm not saying. I'm not saying that you're. No, 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 no. I'm just like, hmm. 
Yeah, I just caught it differently. For me, it felt like the art thing was, it was almost kind of like people who like have fancy books on their bookshelves and they know all the names, but they've never read any of them. But the thing is, he, like, the highlight of his life is that commercial. And, and ad work is extremely artistic. And that ad was extremely artistic. And the motif of Tony, to me, was a very important, important motif. But I can see how... He's so aloof in so many ways. Mm-hmm. You well, know, he really what, is. That's what makes me think that the, the narrator might not have always been like this because he points back to this time and he says it was maybe like 20 years ago that was like his pinnacle achievement. And then after that, he was just like cruising through life. But then he also compares himself with like his colleagues at the time and he says like, uh, like many of them have moved on to these fancy ad agencies and stuff, and I just did kind of like breached like the top of what could be expected from someone who hasn't really done much type of thing. I don't know. It's an interesting thought. Like, why like, didn't he go on to another ad agency and be successful? Like to yeah, me, maybe at one point he he might have had ambitions, but I don't know. Something happened or something. Yeah, because he moved to San Diego, didn't he? From from New York. Yeah, um, he moved to San Diego with his wife. But you don't get the sense. I, that, mm. I was gonna say he did a move to San Diego for some great job opportunity. He just kind of like stumbled on it and then liked it. He went to Denver first, then he was on in Phoenix. Mm-hmm. You, know, you never get a sense that there's any drive. I, I think he stumbled onto his wife, too. <laughs> you know? Um, before he married her, he was a cheater. He he was very vibrant. I'll put that in air quotes. Um, and it seemed like he just kind of died inside. And I've seen that in people who have reached success before they were ready. Or, you know, people who, like, musicians who you know, are, are all in their art, and then they get really successful, and it turns into business, and they just kind of implode. And I, I kind of wonder if that's where his turn was. But I agree with Rami that he probably wasn't always like that, that something changed him in some way, because a lot of these memories show that he was very vibrant and gregarious, and, you know, You don't sleep with a gazillion different women if you're all morose and don't really talk about anything to anybody. (laughs) Just just looking back at the the vignette where his friend was telling him about the interview with the death row uh, criminal and and his wife, who wasn't what she she seemed to be. um, I love that. I know it's, it's great great, great comparison between um, the death row inmate with the glass and then interviewing his wife through glass but in a very very different situation but right at the end of, of, of that piece he, he says um, before the discussion of the difference between repentance and regret you repent the things you've done and regret the chances you let get away then as sometimes happened in a San Diego cafe more often you'd think we we're interrupted by a beautiful young woman selling roses so there there's, there's a there's a clue about, about his his sort of mental process um, you know, regretting the the chances that he's let slip away, um, but then but then being in San Diego, that's all gone. It's it, in in an instant he, he doesn't get chance to to deliberate on that because because this woman comes up for selling roses. You know, it's funny you mentioned that quote because I actually wrote that quote down. I love that quote mm. so much. That's one of my favorite quotes in this book. There were so many places in this story. I just called it a book. It felt like a book. There was so much going on. Um, but there were so many places in the story where it was just supremely quotable and, and, you know, little things that made me sit back and want to think about them for a while. Yeah, but then there were many times when I found myself asking the guy, like, what are you talking about? Talking about his, <laughs> wife, his description. She's petite, lithe, quite smart, short gray hair, no makeup, a good companion. At any moment, the very next second, she could be dead. You know, I think maybe you're just too young for this story. <laughs> you know, perhaps. perhaps. <laughs> you totally got that. 
And I totally get why you don't see the way that no, would just I, annoy the fuck out of you. Can I use the anomaly then? Like, why does she? <laughs> why do you think it's good anyways? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. I think no, he was I, talking I, to you, Anais. Yeah, I think then Anais would be the anomaly. Like, it would make sense, like, the age thing if Anais also didn't like it, but she does. That's why I was surprised that Anais liked it. But I've read, I mean, not, not, not to be, like, too rude about it, but I've also read a lot of works by aging white dudes because that's what's out there. Not, there's other stuff out there, too, but I'm just saying, like, I feel like having read a lot of other modern stuff, that could be considered, you know, so it's just kind of like, okay, I've been exposed enough to these ideas that I'm like, oh, I get what you're doing, just from exposure. <laughs> so what you're saying is, Rami doesn't have a complete understanding of aging white dude psychology. <laughs> no, or that it's like something that you heard, like a bad story you heard so many times it just grows on you. Yeah. Like, I haven't heard it enough times. So, Gerald, as our resident... <laughs> Rami, do you think you should repeat what you said earlier on in the podcast about respecting this author and... <laughs> I thought it was going to sound rude, but I'm just saying. That is so funny. I'm, like, dying over here. Totally dying. <laughs> Not that their experiences were any less valid or that their story wasn't great. I enjoyed it. The craft is masterful. I've dated many of aging white dude. I have, you know, <laughs> I'm, just saying, I'm not served for aging white dude stories. So, given yeah, you... <laughs> the plentitude of them, th th yeah, I think that's why we. Hey, just because there's a lot of stories about aging white dudes doesn't mean that their experience isn't valid. <laughs> exactly. But it does mean I've heard it. So I get it. <laughs> oh God. <laughs> the therapy portion of the podcast. <laughs> so, We're Rami, tell team. me about your mother. <laughs> oh, where do I begin? Oh, man. <laughs> wow, that's another podcast, I think. <laughs> yeah, let's save that one for later. <laughs> <laughs> the outtakes. The oh, Christmas the show, outtakes. Maybe. <laughs> we shows should do outtakes. <laughs> Okay, is there anything else that we want to talk about in the story before we wrap it up and do the vote? The title. That's it. Yes. Uh, <laughs> um, Rami, <laughs> tell us how you feel. No, not just not just the title of the story, the title of the, the vignettes themselves. Like, why was the passage about an artist's romp with a widow called Orphan? I don't understand the connection. <laughs> Good question. <laughs> and I think the artist would say, what does orphan mean to you? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Bang. But it, Shh, don't go there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Oh my I, I, at one point, I was wondering whether the initial letters of the, of the vignette titles sort of made up another word or something. But, but, uh, <laughs> Were you over there doing like anagram? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what does this mean? Might as well. Might as well. <laughs> that is awesome, Gerald. <laughs> uh, oh just, my goodness. That's what I mean about requiring the reader to do too much work. Like when you're reduced to that level where you have to like try to find some <laughs> connection. Hey, sometimes the readers have to work. We can't all be lazy. <laughs> I was, I, was, I was just looking All for all of our short stories can't be Michael Bay. <laughs> I, I was looking for the hidden depth for the to this story. I was looking for the the super secret. Only so many people know it, but but no. I mean, that's the same thing. Like you're trying to find meaning in the movie New Year's Eve, which also has a series of vignettes, which <laughs> which received like five Razzie Award nominations, all of whom lost to Adam Sandler's Jack and Jill. So it wasn't a very good movie. <laughs> That is when you have art being judged by the masses. <laughs> I like how Rami just brings in all these pop cultural references. It's not just me anymore. Very good, it's yeah. Ruby, Adam Sandler. <laughs> but I, I was going to say, since we're not, we're not going to solve the mystery of the title, why? I, I'm sitting here, I'm reviewing the orphan section just because I, I'm trying to remember which one that was. Well, while Maya tries to figure out orphan, the rest of us now I want to know what it means. Whether or not this bothers us, like, does it bother you that the title is just kind of whatever out there? I actually the like the title. I think it works. It's a, the largesse of the sea maiden brings to mind his um, love of folk tales and stories and vignettes of life, and 
and to me, the way he's looking back on his life is as if it was a tale. And so I think it works. But I'm all, like, esoteric and willing to interpret like that. Yeah, see, I hear what you're saying, but I can't reach that far to make the title work for me. <laughs> <laughs> I just can't do it. So for me, I, I guess I'm just like, well, you know what? Oh, orphan! That was about Tony! Tony's an orphan. Nobody really knows him. He is totally orphaned by his family. His family don't even show up for his f memorial. Like, like, that title totally refers to Tony. So there's my explanation of orphan. Really? I had to know. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Do you, I'm sure you can sleep better now. <laughs> no, again, you're you're ascribing. Or no, I'm in I'm I'm interpreting what is there. The section called orphan is the section about but Tony finding the cell phone and then he dies. Of course, it's metaphorical. <laughs> Writing is all about metaphor and and simile and speaking forthright and speaking between the lines and. It, this story is so much about what's not said as much as it is about what's said, and, and yeah, I'm I'm gonna give the author that. Dang it! <laughs> you are so gonna hate me when you read this story. <laughs> oh man! I want to hear from Gerald on the title. Gerald's the only one who hasn't spoken on the title. Um. Yeah. Uh, it's it makes no sense. <laughs> Just, I, I, if if you spent at least six or seven or eight years writing this thing, you'd have thought you could have come. Up with well, a that's bit what of happens. Title. You spend so much time writing about a story, you come up with the most esoteric and artsy title that nobody can freaking understand unless they spend six years in a PhD program studying it. <laughs> no, the largesse of of, uh, of the sea maiden. Yeah, no. The only thing I like about that title is I like phonetically how it sounds. It's just fun to say. Nothing Wouldn't that be story. awesome if, they, if he, like, on his deathbed said, oh, by the way, that story, the title, I just like the way it sounded. Yeah. <laughs> that would just That's be something awesome. he would say, I think. Totally. <laughs> oh, he, no, he'd, he'd say, oh, you know the title, The Large SSC? And then he'd go, bang. <laughs> 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 and then Maya would be like, it's in the things he didn't say. <laughs> his life, his entire life was a metaphor. <laughs> oh, we're so losing it over here. Yep. Okay, are we ready to rate this thing? I think we're ready. Who uh, let, let's save Rami for a second so we can go like good, bad, good me. <laughs> Who wants to go first? <laughs> I'll go first. It's five and a half for me. Five and a half. Five and a half. Like I said, I'm Team Gerald. Five and a half for me. <laughs> so do we want to guess what Remy's going to give it before he votes? <laughs> do, does everyone want to write down their guess? Wait, am I right, Remy? I don't know what your base score is, but I think after this discussion, you might bump it up. <laughs> like to a one. <laughs> You know, I was going to give that a half point, but after this discussion... I, I didn't know read. zero was an option. I thought it was one to six. <laughs> one to so, six. Yeah, that limits me a bit. And no negatives, so... Anyway, um... <laughs> no negatives. No, I think uh, my feelings about the story do have to do with the description of Tony that you mentioned before, uh, Maya. When he says, like, Tony's best friend, I was confused. I'm still confused. That's the one instance in the story where I felt I could relate because I was also confused. So I'm going to give it <laughs> a two. Two? Wow, a two! Oh, yeah. I, I had, I had 1.5. <laughs> I, I was going to say 1.5. I was going to... But you know, no. The the thing that bumped it up to a two was um, the distinction he made between like uh, repenting and uh, regretting. I think that was poignant. And, and I uh, thought he was gonna go with a one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he bumped it, but not because of this discussion. So I still wasn't quite right. Yeah. <laughs> and me. Um... This is funny. I'm giving it a six. I knew you would. That's why you said you love this story so much. I yeah. love this story so much. <laughs> and finding out how the author like 
responded about it just makes me love it even more. Yes. <laughs> I just want to go hug the author. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, that was awesome. So are we ready to do the quiz for next week's story? What are we submitting? Well, I'll, I'll go first. I'm submitting something from the Paris Review, which is Housebreaking by Sarah Frisch. Okay. Uh, I am going to suggest The Monkey's Paw by W.W. W. Jacobs. <laughs> Sorry. And I'm submitting The Semplica Girl Diaries by George Saunders again. I'm determined to get him on this podcast. <laughs> Good luck with that. Okay, I'm getting my hands. Okay, now this quiz, I, I pulled it online. It's actually a quiz for children. I figured I'd give you all a chance to win. <laughs> it's a quiz on art. <laughs> so here we go. Yeah, I, I just couldn't be that mean to you guys. Um, first question. We're going to do uh, 10 questions. If you get it wrong, somebody else. No, we'll just do 10 questions straight across because it'll be easier. No, that's an uneven number. Let me see here. There's three. So let's do nine questions because I don't want this to go on too long. And one tiebreaker. Yeah, we have a tiebreaker just in case. So the first one, Rami. Pablo Picasso's real name is actually how many words long? A5, B12, C23, D19. First name or full name? Full name. His real name is how many words long? How many words? Yep. Five words, 12 words, 23 words, or 19 words? Let's go at 12. His name is 23 oh words oh. long. Wow. <laughs> that, that's excessive. This is for children? Why on earth would any child need to know this? <laughs> <laughs> oh, great. My computer is running out of batteries. One second. got to plug this in. Do, do, do. Talk amongst yourselves. Oh, she's do, gone do, now. Do. Now we can say all the things. Nice. I'm trying. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> Gerald's already giving me a hard time. That, I'm not doing anything. You get up and go away. Yeah. Oh, yeah. All bets are off. Mm -hmm. <laughs> While the cat's away, the mice are playing. Play to win. <laughs> Quick look at her answer sheet. Oh. Okay. Obviously, Anais, you're going to cut all that out, of course. Mm -hmm. So, Gerald. You. It's your time. Oh, this one's good for you. Gosh. English artist Andy Brown. Oh, I probably should put on my microphone, huh? Okay, Gerald. <laughs> now it's time for you. <laughs> English artist Andy Brown created a portrait of Queen Elizabeth II. Used what? A. He used bras. B. He used tea bags. C. He used handkerchiefs. D. He used wigs. Uh, I have no clue. I've never heard of him, but I would say tea bags. Good job. That was wow. such a good guess. He a made a portrait of Elizabeth II using tea bags, which is just awesome. Yeah. Anyways, <laughs> how many paintings did Vincent Van Gogh sell in his lifetime? One, three, or five? One. Correct. Nice. Very nice. She was sounded confident too, didn't she? Mm. She was just like one. Because I thought it was zero. Yeah, I thought it was zero, too. <laughs> okay. Next right. is Rami. Yes. Which architect was responsible for the glass pyramid at the Louvre? Louis Levant? Io M. Pierre? Francois Mansart? Henri Le Bruste? And my French is really old. 
<laughs> um, let's go with Henry. No, it was Pierre. Oops. Pierre you know what, with the French name. Okay. Pierre. Yeah, actually, I don't think his name was French. I think he's the only non-French up there, at least. Pierre. No, Pierre. P E I. Looks more Hawaiian than French, but maybe that's just me. <laughs> So, Gerald, mm -hmm. pop art originated in which city? Amsterdam, New York, Frankfurt, or London? How come? <laughs> I would say London. I'm sitting here, I'm like, how come you got both English questions? I swear, I did not plan that. <laughs> You're right, really? London. So, Annie, mm -hmm. final question. Are you ready? Okay. <laughs> How many times has the Mona Lisa been stolen? Eight, ten, one, or five? Eight? No, it was stolen only once, August 21st, 1911. Wow. So, Gerald, what are we reading next week? Um, I think we're reading Housebreaking by Sarah Frisch. Woohoo! Housebreaking by Sarah Frisch. Oh. But first, be warned. If you don't share your thoughts on the largesse of the sea maiden on our website at literaryroadhouse.com, it may just be one of those things that you'll regret later in life. And please help <laughs> others find our show by leaving a review on iTunes, Stitcher, or Spreaker, and by sharing our podcast with your friends. Until next time, read a good story. Best outro ever. Annie. Well done, Annie. <laughs> that well was done. awesome. Well done. Six out of six for the outro. <laughs> oh my gosh, that was awesome. <laughs> Okie dokie. And that was it. That's I should right. probably stop the broadcast. Yep. That's